Hey members, it's time for questions to the Executive Office and I call Orlea Flynn to ask the first question. Orlea Flynn. question one, please. The minority ethnic development fund is a key element of our policy for racial equality and good race relations. It remains the flagship funding stream supporting voluntary and community organisations to address the needs of people from minority ethnic backgrounds. During its existence, it has supported hundreds of groups and projects. In line with recommendations from a recent review of the fund, the 2021-22 application process opened earlier than normal on the 18th of December 2020 and closed on the 25th of January. The Department has received 58 applications, 32 were successful, and all applicants were informed of the outcome on the 2nd of March 2021. Supplementary, Leah Flynn. Uh, Gormi I thank the First Minister for um, her answer. And as we've heard, the Minority Ethnic Development Fund is supporting crucial work. Um, but I would like to ask the First Minister if she would agree that this work is undermined when political representatives, such as her own party colleague Gregory Campbell, makes unrepentant and uh, unapologetic racist remarks. Well, as I understand it, Gregory has had a very good meeting uh, with the North West Migrants uh, Forum, and of course, uh, I think that uh, conversation continues, and I think that's absolutely positive and the right thing to happen. I call Colin McGrath. Speaker, can I welcome the new timescales that um, the First Minister has announced today and ask that maybe in preparation for next year if it could be brought forward even a little bit more? Because I think the groups are concerned if they only find out on the 2nd of March about their funding and people's contracts are up by the 1st of April, it only gives them a couple of weeks to be able to prepare for what needs to happen in the future. So if there's any way of just getting that cycle of applications brought forward, just even by a month or two, to give groups the opportunity to prepare. I thank the Chairman for his question. Um, I think um, one of the issues that has been raised with us uh, is the need to have longer term funding, and I think that's probably what he's referring to as well. Uh, it is our desire that we would enter into multi year budgets for these groups rather than having to apply every single year because we know the pressure that that puts on organisations having to spend so much time getting ready for applications, having the uncertainty of, because it's a competitive fund, actually knowing if they're going to be funded. So we're currently working uh, within annual budgets. I hope we can move to multi-year budgets next year uh, in the new mandate, and officials are working out the details on how we can achieve this, but it's certainly our intention that that's what we would move to in the next mandate. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much, First Minister. First Minister, from the figures that you've given today, it appears that 45% of those who applied were not successful. Um, I'm just wondering if you're considering taking forward some sort of a programme um, for capacity building for the sector, um, given that so many have been um, turned down at this stage, um, and what other support will be provided for the BAME community? To thank the member uh, for her question. Uh, unfortunately, like most funding streams, uh, the MEDF is um, very much oversubscribed, and she's right uh, to point that out. Um, so, to ensure the projects that best support um, uh, what's going on uh, in the community, there is an application process uh, with proposals being addressed by a selection panel, which is convened by our office, and that panel comprises five members, uh, including our own officials who have knowledge of the minority ethnic sector or issues affecting minority ethnic people who have had experience in, in administering uh, grants. As I say, it is uh, a competitive process, um, but I have to say if anyone has not been successful in this process, they, they should look for feedback. We have made that uh, available because there have been some people who obviously are, are disappointed by the fact that they have not been successful. Uh, so feedback is available, and we hope by getting that feedback that that will help uh, in terms of their applications for uh, another time. Uh, she will be very well aware that uh, we have a, a number of programmes going on within TEU and indeed across government uh, in relation uh, to hate crimes. We have our Peace for Building Positive Relation programme, our own Central Good Relations Fund. Uh, of course, our councils are providing funding uh, as well. Uh, we have been doing a lot of work through our Shared Future Fund. Um, uh, as, uh, as she may be aware, that is a fund that currently is not in the draft budget, uh, but we're fighting very hard to get it into the final budget, um, because we do believe that there is a lot of work to be done. 
But as I say, those groups who haven't been successful in this occasion should certainly seek feedback, and then that may give them the knowledge to apply uh, in, a, in a more hopefully positive way in the next round. Thank you. And questions four and nine have been withdrawn. Can we please bring John Blair to the screen? Thank you, Mr. Can I invite John Blair two? to ask his question? I can invite John Thank Blair. You, to... Speaker, question number two. The Equality Commission and the Human Rights Commission are working jointly to discharge their functions as the dedicated mechanism. As TEO sponsors the Equality Commission, I can provide some general information in respect of the steps it has taken to recruit staff to its dedicated mechanism unit. A director and a number of permanent staff have been appointed, and work is underway to fill the remaining vacancies. Both commissions have engaged with a range of stakeholders to raise awareness of the role and remit of the dedicated mechanism and Article 2 commitments. This has included engagement with the Northern Ireland Office, our own office, the Independent Monitoring Authority and the Executive Office Assembly Committee. John Blair, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the First Minister for that answer. C can I ask further to that if the First Minister can clarify if the Joint Commissions are or will be given access required to uh, departmental information so that they can determine the, the current and, po and possible future challenges and issues which may arise across departments out of um, EU exit? Well, as, I, as I've said, we sponsor um, the Equality Commission. The NIO uh, looks after the Human Rights Commission, um, so they're obviously in charge of the governance in and around that. Um, the protocol, including the dedicated mechanism, uh, is uh, the commitment of the UK government, uh, and consequently it is responsible for looking after the funding uh, of the Commission. So I would imagine there will be no difficulties with either Commission, given that they're independent organisations engaging right across government to get any information that they need to deal with the matters that the member has raised. Nicole Kessler Salford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Article 2 of the protocol reflects the commitment made to uphold the Belfast Agreement. Given that the agreement's principle of consent is being turned upon its head, is the First Minister aware of any indication that the Human Rights Commission or the Equality Commission are considering the impact upon the human rights of members of the pro union community in Northern Ireland? Well, yes, the member is correct. Uh, Article 2 of the protocol says that the uh, United Kingdom so shall continue to facilitate the related work of the institutions and bodies set up pursuant to the 1998 agreement, including the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland. So it will be very interesting to see uh, whether either of those commissions will have been looking at the diminution of rights uh, under the uh, implementation of the protocol, and in particular uh, the change in the principle of consent that was affected by the Secretary of State uh, in the House of Commons uh, under a statutory instrument. I think it was the 9th of December, changing the consent from cross-community consent to a simple majority. So I will uh, await with interest uh, whether either of those organisations have any comment in relation to those matters. I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Can the First Minister provide uh, an update on the funding for the dedicated mechanism and outline the financial position for 2021? The uh, Equality Commission have agreed funding with the UK Government to discharge, to discharge the new role of the dedicated mechanism, and the initial funding agreement is for three years, uh, running until 2022-23. Uh, the Northern Ireland Office have advised that in common with all UK Government and Northern Ireland Departments and armed length bodies, future funding for the dedicated mechanism beyond 2023 will be subject to the normal spending review processes. But funding has been agreed between uh, the Equality Commission and the Northern Ireland Office, totalling uh, £1,898,000 for three years until March 2023. I call John Stewart. Mr Speaker, um, does the First Minister agree with me that equality of opportunity has been undermined in respect of goods and services as a direct outworking of the Northern Ireland Protocol? 
Uh, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, we are in a situation where consumer choice is being threatened in relation to the operation of the protocol. Uh, and indeed, if, were it not for the actions taken by our own government supply lines, uh, we were told at a meeting of the Business Engagement Forum on Friday, would have been severely curtailed because people would have been taking action to get ready for the end of the grace period. So there, there are severe difficulties in relation to the operation of the protocol, and as he says, in relation to equality of opportunity. I call Jim Allister. Given that uh, under the protocol, huge huge swathes of the law as it affects our economy will now be made by a foreign power with obvious detriment to local political and equality rights. Would the First Minister expect those who go by the name of Human Rights Commission and Equality Commission to show an interest in and report on such matters? Well, as I indicated to uh, my friend, the member for South Belfast, I would have thought that that would have been something that both, commun uh, both commissions would have been interested in, given the fact that Article 2 is there uh, supposedly to protect the Belfast Agreement and, of course, the operation of the protocol uh, and the way uh, the architecture has been set up has changed the Belfast Agreement. So, therefore, there should be uh, a real and meaningful look at the protocol and its operation by the Equality Commission and the Human Rights Commission. They call Karen Mullen. Can I call you question number three? Uh, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, Junior Minister Middleton will answer this question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the member for her question? Uh, completed capital pro projects totalling an investment of £915,000 in the Bogside Fountain Bishop Street Urban Village include Destined Learning Disability Centre, uh, Fountain Play Park, and Abercorn Road Environmental Improvement Scheme as well. The refurbishment of Cathedral Youth Club is nearing completion. The planning application has been approved for the Newgate Cultural Centre. The project will involve the redevelopment of the existing centre with the addition of a new performance space. Design work has commenced for a new build extension to the Gas Yard Centre, and the business case for the Mean and Square Development Project is with the Department for Finance. Work is ongoing to acquire the site subject to business case approval. Carmel, supplementary. The Minister for his answer. Uh, I welcome this pro progress in particular, uh, the progress at Mean and Square, as will the residents of Dove Gardens and Abbots Walk who have had to endure this eyesight for far too many years. And it is important that we continue to invest in our communities and neighbourhood, neighbourhoods alongside the bigger strategic projects within the city deal. Minister, I notice the Realm project is in the early development stage. This will put the finishing touches. Can you give us a time scale on when this project is likely to go ahead? Can I thank the member for her question and her comments? And I completely agree that this is something which is very much of good benefit uh, to the area. And I welcome the support of all of the elected representatives on the ground and working with urban villages. Uh, in terms of a time scale, I don't have a time scale to hand in terms of the public realm work. I do know that the member has been proactive in lobbying for that. Uh, it's something which we very want to see, very much want to see, alongside, of course, the uh, investment in the derelict buildings and, and uh, the wider area. So I'm happy to write to the member and come back to. The member in terms of a time scale uh, for the public realm. I call Keith Buchanan. Thank you, uh, Minister, for your answer so far. Minister, can you outline the background to the Urban Villages programme to myself and the House? I, I thank the member for the question. Um, Urban Villages Initiative is a headline action of the executives together building the United Community Strategy. It is a good relations programme led by the Executive Office and spans across four areas in Belfast and one in Londonderry. With each of the areas having a history of deprivation and social tension, the combined population of these areas is in excess of 100,000 people. A capital programme estimated at £47 million has been approved, subject to funding up until March 2023, and that's to support development of up to 76 capital projects right across the five urban village areas. This investment by the Urban Villages Initiative builds and transforms community facilities and spaces into catalysts and beacons for shared space and good relations. These are designed to equip and empower communities to increase, enhance and sustain the extent and nature of connections and relationships between people within each space. They are physical anchors providing a long-term legacy and enabling a people and a place-based infrastructure to realise the ambition of the Urban Villages Initiative as a long-term driver of good relations. 
Uh, categorisation of the capital projects reflects the amount of financial investment in each, but also, crucially, the planned impact on the lives of people living in urban village areas and contribution to promoting good relations. Uh, there are three uh, broad project categories which have been developed to support the capital planning model. Uh, transformational projects, which generally are £2 million or above, which will have a major impact in terms of the urban village areas. There's landmark projects, estimated between 500000 and £2 million, and the local projects, of course, course which will focus on the use of uh, and mainly localised impact. So uh, I thank the member for the question. Obviously, uh, this is a good news uh, project for all of those areas, and we look forward to seeing the rollout over the coming months. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I call Mark Durgan. Aaron Mark Durgan. I can call you and I thank the junior minister for his responses and I very much welcome his update on, on all these schemes. I, like Ms Mullen, have a particular interest in the, the Meaning Square scheme and I'd like to commend officials who have been working very diligently on this and working hard to seal the deal with landowners, albeit for a price less than that originally agreed. Uh, th th this will be much more than a simple physical regeneration scheme. Can uh, the Minister outline any of the detail of what this scheme will consist of and how it will be sustained going forward? Uh, can I thank the member for his um, question? I do share his comments in relation to officials. I think that they've done a tremendous job in getting the project uh, to this stage. And, and again, I reiterate the fact that uh, the support of political members is very much important in terms of all of those projects within uh, those areas. Uh, the Urban Villages Initiative Transformation Project uh, in London Derry is, of course, the Meaning Square project. This project will have a truly transformational impact on the space and for the people of the area. The Urban Villages Initiative has developed the business case for this major mixed-use regeneration project, uh, which aims to reinvent the site as a shared space uh, for fostering positive community identities, building good relations, but also harnessing the wider economic and social benefits, thus reclaim reclaiming and repurposing what was a dilapidated site uh, and which has long, uh, far too long been a catalyst for antisocial behaviour as well. The business case has been submitted to the Department for Finance for consideration. Work is ongoing, obviously, to uh, secure the purchase of the site subject to the business case approval. Due to the site's history of antisocial behaviour, it is important that fencing is installed immediately to mitigate this risk. In preparation for this, APEC submitted a planning application on the 7th of October 2020, which will allow for fencing to be erected to secure the site immediately on purpose. Um, I hope and would expect that uh, the Urban Villages officials will keep uh, all political representatives up to date in the course of the next uh, coming weeks, but I, I would agree with the member that it's very much a priority uh, for the Urban Villages initiative. I call the Rose Kelly. Mr Speaker, question five, First Minister. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, with uh, permission, I will answer questions 5, 6, 10 and 13 uh, together. Uh, let me first of all say that the Deputy First Minister and I remain entirely committed to delivering this scheme, which aims to go some way to acknowledging the suffering and trauma of victims and survivors who are living with significant disabilities. The recent court judge uh, ruling has made it clear that there is a legal duty for victims' payments to be made. And it is important that we emphasise that to victims and survivors and the organisations indeed that represent them. However, the important issue of the funding pressure on the block grant arising from the scheme remains to be resolved. Uh, it remains our view that the scheme should be funded by the Westminster Government as an addition to the block grant. Deputy First Minister and I, along with the Justice Minister and the Finance Minister, met the Secretary of State on 23 February to discuss funding to the block. Discussions focused on a flexible approach to finding and accommodation on funding issues. We committed to work together to achieve a positive resolution as quickly as possible for victims in line with the recent Court of Appeal judgment. It was agreed that further work would be taken forward by officials and that we would meet again in the near future. The Executive has committed significant funding this year to establish the administrative arrangements for the scheme. Progress to date includes ongoing development of an online system to receive applications, the appointment of an interim victims payment board, the appointment by the Department of Justice of an assessment service provider, and accommodation secured for staff who will be delivering the scheme. The Lord Chief Justice also recently announced Mr Justice McAlinden as President of the Victims Payment Board. The draft budget for 2021-22 provides £6.7 million for administrative costs 
In particular, this will allow victims' organisations to recruit additional staff to support applicants to the scheme. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the First Minister for a response. I'm sure she'll agree with me. It's pretty appalling uh, that victims have had to go to the to, for, for legal redress. You know, and what's the next step? I mean, are we going are we going to force victims back into court to try to get a political fix? And I, I don't know whether or not the First Minister can give us any insight into how the figure of £800 million has been arrived at as a potential cost, because many people are surprised at that amount. I do want to thank the member for her question. I think it is pretty appalling. I absolutely agree with the member um, that uh, this ended up in court. Um, but I do want to say very clearly and put on the record that those victims and survivors who will be recipients of the payment should not be distressed or concerned because the payment is an entitlement, regardless of where it comes from, whether it's from Westminster or from our block grant, and it will be paid when it is due. And I also reflect uh, the words of Alan McBride recently when he said people should not be made to feel guilty about um, applying for this application. I want to say to him, absolutely not. Far from it. These people are entitled to uh, this money and um, discussions on a uh, funding source will not prevent us from paying out money uh, that is due to uh, these victims and survivors. Uh, in terms of the figures that have been spoken about, I, I do say to the member that that work is ongoing. Uh, government actuarials from Westminster have been working with our officials to try uh, and look uh, at the range of expenditure that can be predicted, but it's demand-led, so it's very, very difficult to uh, assess, particularly uh, in relation to psychological permanent disablement, how many people are going to come forward. And they're in uh, lies a difficulty, so we have to try and find a way through that difficulty uh, and to find certainty. But just to reiterate, recipients of these payments who are due this payment should not be distressed, should not be concerned, they will be paid. I call Chris Stafford. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that those who devised the scheme should be reasonably expected to finance it? And the continuing, uh, the continuing foot dragging by the Secretary of State on this issue does a gross disservice to many victims. Well, I think it is important that um, uh, we recognise that this scheme was set up in Westminster. And normally, under policy, uh, the, the place that designs the scheme is then res responsible for the funding uh, of the scheme. Uh, we do recognise that the Assembly was not sitting at the time, and that is why um, the Government took action. Uh, however, we do feel that the way forward is uh, collaboration between ourselves and the Northern Ireland Office to find a way through all of this. I think that is really important uh, so that we end this uncertainty that has been going on for far too long. I think we all acknowledge that and the need for us to work with victims groups and uh, directly with victims themselves so that they can get due recompense for the suffering that they have had. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the costs of the troubles related permanent disabled payment uh, have rocketed, as has been alluded to. Can the minister outline the assumptions her office made to lead the government uh, actuary department to put an upper figure of uh, 1.2 billion on the lifetime costs of the scheme? Well, as I've indicated, um, initially work was carried out by our own officials here, and then the government actuarial department uh, in Whitehall has now been involved with us to try uh, and establish uh, the scheme. Uh, the scheme is quite, uh, and I, uh, I'm not making any uh, apology for this, I think the scheme is a good scheme and it's a wide ranging scheme and because of that um, there are huge costs uh, that are there so we need to find a way to cover those costs. Um, the permanent disability uh, is 14%. So in the scheme, that's uh, not at the highest range. So there'll be quite a few people that will come forward uh, who will meet that 14%. Uh, and therefore, we need to try and assess how we can cover all of those payments. And of course, the early payments uh, will be more because those over 60 can actually take a lump sum. So they may decide to take a lump sum instead of an annual payment. Uh, and that being the case, there will be a higher level uh, of uh, money needed at the start of this scheme. So we'll continue to do the work. Uh, with the Government Actuarial Department. Uh, it is uh, a, a very technical piece of work. There's a lot of unknowns there as well, but it's trying to get an estimate that we can then move forward from. I call Keith Buchanan. 
Thank you, and thank the First Minister for answering so far. First Minister, obviously, there's, there's uh, families across Northern Ireland that are bereaved that of an empty chair that's never, ever, ever going to be filled. What communication have you had with them or groups that represent them after the recent course case or most recent correspondence with them? Well, of course, the office uh, and I, in particular, have. Uh, very aware of the issues affecting bereaved victims and, and survivors, and we're keen to address as many of their needs and acknowledge their ongoing loss, uh, which of course is still very keenly felt. Uh, currently, the Victims Fund uh, provides self directed assistance payments and health and wellbeing support to bereaved individuals who had registered with them before the 31st of March. Um, our officials have been working with the Commission for Victims and Survivors and the Victims and Survivors Service to consider options to meet the needs of bereaved victims and survivors, and we have now agreed that we will allow a scheme to open shortly with payments made from April 2021 uh, for those people who were not uh, captured before 31 March 2017. I very much welcome this, and I want to acknowledge the work uh, of, in particular, South East Romana Foundation. Uh, they have been lobbying for a long time to have this scheme reopened, uh, and I am very pleased that we have been re- able to reopen the scheme so that we can take forward the needs of the bereaved. I call Linda Dillon. Eremar, Linda Dillon. Garmail, good can call you and thank the Minister for her answers thus far. And I, and I would like to welcome the announcement that the, the scheme will be reopened, Minister, in relation to those who have been bereaved. Could I just clarify in terms of the, the policy? That has been developed around the permanent disablement scheme. It, it was developed in Westminster, and according to their own um, their their own statement of funding policy, that means they have to fund it. So I think we're agreed across this house, and I just want to establish that that we are agreed across this house that the British government have a responsibility to fund this scheme, to fund our block grant, and ter- so that we can meet the sca- payments of this scheme particularly given the comments that have already been made around the fact that we can no longer afford to allow these victims to wait and to have that fear, that constant fear that they have that the scheme is going to fall at the last hurdle and that they're going to end up back in the courts. We don't want to say that. <coughs> Thank the member for her question. She's right that the policy funding statement um, says that where the scheme is developed, of course, the government argue that they only developed the scheme because there was no uh, administration here at that time, uh, and that's where there is some uh, discussion going on in relation to uh, these matters. I think there is very much a need for us to collaborate together to find a way forward, uh, a way forward that's acceptable to all of us. And I hope that uh, both the NIO um, and the Finance Minister here, are, and the Justice Minister for that matter, will work with the Deputy First Minister and I to find a solution what is at the moment uh, quite a big funding gap, it has to be said, Mr Speaker, uh, but it is vitally important that we deal with those matters together. I call Jim Allister. Um, the Court of Appeal was very emphatic that the legal duty is on the Executive Office to fund the scheme. On Friday in the Court, according to press reports, Council representing the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister said this. The position has always been that the Executive Office will fund the scheme when it has the money. It doesn't have the money. Could the First Minister reconcile that conditional statement with the assurance today that that no one will go short and the money will be paid once it is due? Well, I think, to be fair to um, the Executive Office, we are acting under court judgment at present, so we will have to pay the money out. I mean, the Court of Appeal have been very clear uh, in relation to this issue. Uh, they have now joined, as the member is probably aware, the Department of Finance uh, to the proceedings. I think that is a helpful move, uh, because, of course, the TEO does not have money in and of itself, uh, but, of course, uh, the Department of Finance does. So it is important that I send out that very clear message today that when uh, the applications come in when the money is due to victims, they will get their money. That ends the period for a list of questions. And, uh, we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call uh, Claire Sugden, whose question has been withdrawn. So I call Sinead Bradley. Mr. Speaker, 
and happy International Women's Day, First Minister. Um, my question seeks to support those women who were victims and survivors of the notorious mother and baby homes. While I welcome the expert panel uh, who will work with victims to set the terms of reference for an independent investigation, I do note and am disappointed that it is not a full public inquiry. And on that basis, I ask the Minister what assurances she can give us that the inquiry will have sufficient powers to gather all the information required to seek absolute truth and justice. Well, thank the member and happy uh, International Women's Day to her uh, as well. Uh, can I say that the, the group that has been set up uh, is not the final destination. They are working uh, with the victims under the leadership of Judith Gillespie in trying to co-design what will be uh, the final outcome in relation to whether it is a public inquiry or whether it's uh, another sort of inquiry. Uh, I think that the, the names that we have been able to secure in that expert panel are very heavyweight people uh, and uh, I think will give a lot of confidence uh, to the victims of this terrible time in our history. And I very much hope that they can work collaboratively to come back then to find out what sort of an inquiry it is that they want us to take forward. Supplementary, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answer so far. Given that the Irish Government have already um, realised that there is a requirement for legislative change around this issue, and without wanting to preempt any outcome of that uh, panel that you referred to, I would ask have the Executive Office carried out any initial scoping exercise work to establish um, if there will be any legislative requirements? And I do look at um, the Irish Government in terms of their looking at legislation around GDPR and also uh, a law focused on providing dignified burials. Has any consideration been given to that regard? Well, of course, the member will know that we are at a slightly different point um, in our process and the Republic of Ireland. They had a commission of inquiry for quite some time. Uh, that report came out in January. They have now decided that they need to take a number of steps in relation to that. I can't prejudge what it is uh, the inquiry will, first of all, look like, um, but also what the outcomes of that will be. Uh, but I would assume, and maybe it's wrong of me to assume that, that there will be very similar outcomes in, in terms of uh, parts of what you're seeing now in the Republic of Ireland around memorialisation, around apologies, around all of the things, uh, recompense that are going on there. But as I say, this has been set up uh, in a way that we get the largest amount of buy-in from the victims who frankly lost their voice in the past, and we want them to have a voice in this process, and that's why co-design and co-production is so important to us for this process. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. Um, could I ask the, the First Minister if she could please outline the specific, detailed and unambiguous regulations applying to students who are residing at a term time address in relation to COVID-19 restrictions um, in, in terms of their bubbling and travelling in the lead-up to St Patrick's Day and the Easter period? Well, obviously that's more of a matter for the Minister for the Economy, who looks after uh, students' rights uh, and everything connected with that. But first of all, let me say this to the member. It, it is very important that everybody abides by the public health regulations at the moment. Um, and unfortunately, we've seen yesterday in parts of Belfast people who were rightly jubilant uh, about Rangers' success in the SPL, and I send them my absolute good wishes. It's wonderful to see Stephen Gerrard and our own Stephen Davis at the top of the SPL. But as Ali McCoist rightly said, we have to abide by the public health regulations. They're there for a reason. They're there to protect uh, our communities. And I would make the same plea uh, in relation to students uh, coming up to uh, St Patrick's Day. I'm hoping uh, that because a lot of students are studying from home remotely at this present moment in time, that there won't be the same crowds in and around um, Belfast. But we will be sending out very specific messages uh, about St Patrick's Day uh, next week uh, before the date takes place. Claire Bailey, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, and I asked the question in relation to um, the PSNI response to, in the Holy Land area last week, where there were £11,000 worth of COVID 
fines handed out. Um, so there's a hamster wheel that goes on uh, every year. I've been dealing with this long before I was elected, but you know the, the problems within the Holy Lands extend beyond the COVID pandemic. Um, but I'm aware that the executive have set up a task force to try and deal with this back in August, September, when we were seeing the influx over freshers. Can the minister give us an update on what has taken place with the executive in re relation to the Holy Lands task force? Yes, so it's a, a, it's a subgroup, if you like, of our overall task force, and uh, I know that the health minister has been engaging with it because, of course, he has concerns coming up to uh, St Patrick's Day, and I'm more than happy to write to the member about uh, and give her an update in relation to the work that is ongoing. But I do know that that work is ongoing, and as I say, we will be communicating generally about St Patrick's Day and indeed uh, about Easter uh, as well in the coming days. I call Trevor Lund. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the minister will be aware that this is Irish Language Week. I hope she is, anyway. And uh, can I ask her, would she join with me in acknowledging and welcoming this annual event, and congratulate the Irish Language Movement on their ongoing work to promote their cause? I thank you. This is a very busy week this week, I have to say, to the member between International Women's Day and Commonwealth Day and now uh, Irish Language Week uh, as well. It's becoming a very congested uh, part of the year. Uh, look, I absolutely acknowledge uh, the work that goes on to uh, promote uh, the Irish language uh, across Northern Ireland uh, and indeed those from the Ulster Scots community who wish to promote the Ulster Scots uh, language and identity. And uh, of course, uh, if they uh, desire to have a week to celebrate uh, Irish Language Week. Uh, I wish them well for their week of celebration. Supplementary, Trevor Lund. Yes, I, th I thank the First Minister for that. It was well said. And it's actually a two-week period. It's not even one week anymore. Can I, can I ask the First Minister if she can confirm the promise made by herself and her deputy colleague at, at the Executive Committee recently? that the Irish language legislation will be introduced, enabling the appointment of an Irish language commissioner in time for it to be completed and enacted before the end of this mandate. Well, as the member will know, uh, that's part of a package um, of identity and cultural pieces that we'll be bringing forward, uh, as we said, under the NDNA uh, agreement. And it is our uh, intention that that will come forward so that it will be completed by the end of this mandate. I'm almost tempted now to say Sinead, but uh, maybe not. Well, it's Sinead Foster. So I call William Humphrey. Uh, question number five. Ask me a question. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I take this opportunity to um, wish the uh, First Minister a very happy Commonwealth Day as Chair of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association here at Stormont. Can I ask the First Minister to update the House on what action she's taken to rid Northern Ireland of this obnoxious Northern Ireland Protocol? Well, a happy Commonwealth Day uh, to the members. Well, as I say, it's a, it's a busy day today, uh, and it's good to see the Commonwealth flag uh, flying over Stormont Parliament buildings today. Um, in terms of the protocol, as a member will know, it is causing untold damage uh, to relations in Northern Ireland, uh, east-west, in terms of the trade and indeed in terms of the identity of those of us who are unionists. And there's a need not just to uh, tinker at the edges uh, with the protocol, there is a need to have a replacement of the protocol. Uh, that is the position, obviously, not of TEO, uh, but of myself, and there's a need to deal with that urgently because there is damage happening to the economy here in Northern Ireland and therefore under its own terms there needs to be a recalibration. Supplementary William Humphrey. Thank you very much and I thank the First Minister for her answer and I too join with her in congratulating Stephen Davis and the Rangers football team on screwing the fastest ever Scottish Premier League. Um, only a few days ago, First Minister, I was contacted by a scout leader in my constituency who was working with the Woodland Trust and planting trees. That's had to be put on hold because they haven't been able to bring the trees in from the mainland. The synagogue is in my constituency. The Jewish community has been unable to get kosher meat. And as we reach Passover, this is something that's become particularly acute. Is Her Majesty's Government aware of the scale and depth of the problems that this protocol is causing to people in Northern Ireland, that this isn't some sort of hiccup or teething problem, as the Prime Minister might suggest? Well, I thank the member for those very real and tangible uh, examples of the impact on, on the protocol. And I, I note his remarks about the Jewish community, something 
which is very concerning, I have to say. We have a very small Jewish community here in Northern Ireland, uh, and the fact that they can't access uh, kosher meat is something that would cause me a great deal of concern. Um, I attended the uh, Secretary of State's Business Engagement Forum uh, on Friday last, and I have to say, universally, uh, the business community there uh, welcomed the fact uh, that the Secretary of State had put this variation uh, in place, albeit only for another number of months, because they said that the need to make variation was, had to happen at the beginning of March, because if it hadn't happened at the beginning of March, then some product lines would have ceased within the next week or so. They raised concerns about cost, about delay, about technical difficulties, about the diversion of trade. And sometimes I listen to people in this House, Mr Speaker, speak about what business wants. I listened very clearly what businesses want, and they don't want the continuation of what we've seen uh, in this protocol. And I've also listened to people say that the action taken by Her Majesty's Government was illegal. The Attorney General of the United Kingdom will say otherwise. And frankly, that's good enough for me in terms of the protocol. We call John O'Dowd. Thank you, Minister, for answers so far. Minister, I want to touch on another aspect of your campaign against the protocol. You will be aware that the executive is actively engaged in attempts to eradicate paramilitarism through its paramilitary task force and associated campaigns. Do you not think the fact that you met with representatives of these gangs? that are actively now involved in criminality, drug dealing and murder undermines the message from the executive? No, not at all, uh, because um, the members uh, that we met are committed to peaceful and democratic means. And I have to find it astounding to hear criticism from Sinn Féin when the Army Council is still in existence. And that's not my assessment. That's the assessment of the Chief Constable of the PSNI. So it's very hard to take criticism from sources that should know better. What we want to do is to encourage everybody to engage in peaceful politics, in constitutional politics, if they have a concern, that they can raise that concern, that they're not alienated, that they don't feel as if nobody's listening to them. I think that's the important point about the engagement with the LCC, and it really, really is astounding hear members of Sinn Féin come out and criticise this party, which has always condemned violence of any source, for us meeting the LCC. Quite incredible. Supplementary, John O'Dowd. The, the First Minister will be aware this is not the first occasion that political unionism has sought common cause with armed loyalist groups. Uh, in relation to the point I'm making is this. These groups are actively involved today in crimes largely against the communities which the DUP represent and unionism represents. You sat down with them not seeking them to go away. You sat down with them seeking common cause in your opposition against the protocol. Do you not believe that that was a mistake? I'm very interested to know how the member knows what I said to the LCC, Mr Speaker. Was he there? No, he wasn't there. I've always been very clear with members of paramilitary organisations from whenever they come from, that they should cease and desist from their criminality. Always. And I will always do that. Because what they need to do is to move away from that. That's what our Communities and Transition programme is all about, is it not? Which sits in the TEO. Is he suggesting that we move away from Communities and Transition? Which is doing, by the way, Mr Speaker, very good work in communities right across Republican areas and Loyalist areas. So let's have less of the cant and hypocrisy in this House, and let's have some realism. I call Tom McKinnon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, on 19th of August 1998, as a date that no doubt is etched in all of our memories, when 10 past 3 that afternoon, 29 innocent people plus two unborn children lost their lives and the car bomb in Oma, which is described as the single worst atrocity of the murderous campaign in Northern Ireland. Since then, you will know that the victims and their families have been seeking justice, and in 2013, they um, issued a ju judicial proceedings, which concluded six years later in 2019. Yet to date, a verdict has not been forthcoming from the Lord Chief, 
Chief Justice, can I ask you for your assessment of this appalling delay in this process? I want to thank the member for <coughs> facilitating a meeting with um, some of the OMA victims uh, recently, where again I was struck by their determination um, and their desire uh, to seek justice for their families and for their loved ones. Uh, and he's right, we all remember back to that really dreadful day um, when that uh, horrific bombing took place. And the delay is quite incredible. Um, the delay has been going on now. I think it was, they said, four judges have been involved in this particular judicial review. And the final hearing uh, was in July of 2019. And yet there's still no judgment in relation to this matter. So I do think uh, that there needs to be closure brought in relation to the judicial review so that the families can move on in their campaign to find justice. Um, time's up. Um, apologies. Um, we now move on to questions to the Minister for Communities, and questions 4 and 13 have been withdrawn. Members, take your raise for a moment, please.